It's Dutch Buzz's 10th anniversary this year, and we are celebrating our decade with a string of pearls as we honor those who have made a special contribution to the international community in The Hague. The Hague has one of the highest percentages of volunteers in the world, with more than 120,000 of the city's residents involved in some form of community service or charity work on a volunteer basis. To accommodate the international community in the city, there's even a volunteer recruitment agency that is devoted to finding work for people who don't necessarily speak Dutch, but wish to contribute to the city's NGOs and other services. This week's Dutch Buzz Pearl is project manager of Volunteer The Hague, Tetiana Benzural, who has made recruiting volunteers her passion. She speaks to me about her work and how volunteering helped her to find her role in The Hague. What particular vacancies are there in this crisis time, let's call it that? Well, you name it. Uh, currently, we have, um, um, in a way, uh, like two different uh, um, categories of vacancies. Uh, first category, these are the vacancies that are directly related uh, to corona crisis. So the organizations that are dealing with um, corona-related issues, they post their vacancies on our website, and they place word corona, for example, in a title or somewhere in a text, and then the vacancies are being filtered based on that. So on, uh, on the homepage, on of our website you can find um, um, a separate tab that would um, yeah, by clicking on it that would show you the vacancies that are related to corona crisis and the second category would be in a way the rest of the vacancies that are not necessarily dealing with the corona crisis but they still adhere to all the um, uh, rules that are in place, the social distancing and etc. etc. So, for example, um, corona related um, vacancies would be uh, helping elderly um, um, in the elderly houses that have been affected by corona that cannot leave their premises. So, that would be the one even entertaining them or doing some things online that's already one of the vacancies there or baking some goods for them. Uh, uh, the second category of vacancies uh, about more more on a, um, I would say, how would I say, regular vacancies. <laughs> um, and that would be in maybe gardening, for example, where you can still have one meter and a half distancing, um, but you still ca- um, help out a non-profit organization. So these are the first things that come to mind, but there are yeah. just close to 300 vacancies, I think, on a website. Good, and they all sound like really worthy mm-hmm. vacancies in these yeah. these very difficult times for yeah. everybody. Now, how do you persuade um, a candidate to volunteer in these times? Uh, they're obviously concerned about their health. Yes, I completely agree. They they are uh, in fact concerned, uh, but we already have a quite a large audience of volunteers that are happy to contribute, and the international community has been very very active during this Corona crisis times. Uh, the newsletter that was sent back uh, in April that featured uh, all the Corona related vacancies was one of the most viewed and clicked through newsletters that we have ever sent out. That already shows you that people were eager to do. Something. They were eager to help out their home uh, country, their host country. Um, they were really in need of being informed what is there that they can do. What does that tell you about our international community in The Hague, Tatiana? <laughs> we are very active, conscious, and we want to contribute. Uh, and, and for you personally, um, hmm. what have been the challenges? Challenges, um, you mean personal challenges or no, work-wise, no, yeah. work-wise challenges? Well, one of the biggest challenges, of course, is um, working from home. Uh, having um, everything done remotely is um, is quite a bit of a challenge. Uh, and I have a daughter of two and a half years old, so at the beginning when uh, the corona crisis was really at its peak and uh, the daycares were closed, that was, I think every parent can relate to this, when you are mother during the day and then during the night you are back on track trying to work and then good luck catching up some sleep in between. So that was the biggest challenge. Lessons learned? Yes, so hopefully the daycares will remain open because if they do close, um, the challenge will continue. (laughs) Now, uh, selecting people on paper and uh, you mentioned uh, digitally uh, via one of the many video apps. How is that different to -to face-to-face? Because, I mean, you are responsible for the selection in the end. 
Well, Volunteer at the Hague is the um, uh, is a platform that offers uh, numerous volunteer opportunities on behalf of non-profit organizations. So see us kind of like a middleman. Mm. So we provide opportunity for organizations to post their volunteer vacancies, and we also provide op opportunity for internationals to apply for these volunteer vacancies. We do not do active selection of volunteers. Organizations that uh, have posted their volunteer vacancies, they do the selection. And if there are any questions or issues in a place, then we're jumping to resolve them. But it's uh, on the shoulders of organizations to select their own volunteers. Now, how did you yeah. find this position for yourself in, in The Hague? Uh, well, that um, happened um, quite a while ago, back in 2015. I started myself as a volunteer, um, and uh, I'm a big believer in volunteering, in fact. And I knew that as a new person in a country where we don't really have a support network, where the, the mentality is just different compared to the country that you lived before. So everything seemed to be different, and the best way to try and uh, and get familiar with the culture, I don't want to say integrate, but at least get familiar with the things around you, with, um, just rebuild your support network. Volunteering is, the, in my opinion, the best way, and the, at least the best way to start. And maybe that's why I'm so good at doing volunteer, running volunteer at the Hague, because I'm a firm believer in yeah. volunteering, that it You've helps. You've lived it, done it. Got, <laughs> the, got the t-shirt now. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> in fact, I do have the t-shirt that says volunteer at the Hague. <laughs> <laughs> so yes, I started as a volunteer, and when opportunity presented itself, I was hired as a project manager of Volunteer at the Hague. Yeah. If you were to, to look back over the, the last five years, mm -hmm. how many people have you managed to help? Oh, quite a bit. Uh, uh, just the result of um, uh, our mix and match networking events that we, well, used to run this year. We hope they will be able to rerun them again. The the result would be around 300 uh, volunteer opportunities would be filled just as a result of these events, um, based on the self-reported data from organizations that are participated. Um, as you remember, I would call each organization because you would participate there as well, and I would go like, how many? your volunteers have you hired as a result of your participation at our mix and match networking yeah. event i'm just thinking i think mm -hmm. we have had at least five yeah and really just, good candidates um from volunteer the hague to help uh, us on dutch buzz so so awesome. thank you thank you for oh you're welcome the That's years of, of cooperation so far and i hope we continue thank you um, and i think the stress also goes to the quality of volunteers because uh, the, the numbers um they can be high they can be really high but then if there is a rotation of volunteers, then uh, then the organizations, they don't benefit so much from having volunteers. But the beauty of volunteers that are associated with Volunteer at the Hague, they are uh, relatively young, relatively highly educated, and of course motivated. They want to do something. And just as I mentioned during the Corona crisis, the newsletter, the number of clicks and everything showed that they want to contribute. So the internationals uh, that come through Volunteer at the Hague, they are eager to help out, and most of the time they do stay with organizations when they apply and they want to volunteer for them. So just like you said yourself, these were good volunteers that you got. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. I recommend Volunteer the Hague every time. Coming from the perspective of an unemployed person, mm. do they not sometimes see volunteers as a bit of a threat um, in terms of mm. doing jobs for which they might be paid for? Well, volunteering should never, ever substitute a paid position. So I don't um, see this um, as, a, as a valid threat in any way. Neither do I think that any Dutch person or international would see it this way. Um, mostly see volunteering as a way to, um, to, to have something um, um, kind of in a way uh, to have something on their resume, to, to keep their skills up to date, to have um, to rebuild their social network, to don't want to say to keep busy, but I remember when I started doing volunteer work, I just simply did not want to stay at home. I wanted to, to be out there, to, to have something to do. And usually volunteering is not a full time, it's a once a week, twice a week, so it, it, it's not the way to substitute a paid position in any way. What checks and balances are in place to make sure that people are not exploited? 
Well, as a PAP and as a volunteer of the Hague project, we check uh, each and every organization that uh, posts their volunteer vacancies uh, with us on the website. Um, if there are any complaints, uh, then we investigate them thoroughly. Sometimes uh, organizations promise paid positions right there in the interview, then of course that raises a red flag. And we always, always hear about that because internationals um, are very outspoken. We are a very strong community. Uh, so of course, um, right the moment we hear, then we investigate, have a chat with the organization. We either uh, remove all the vacancies. Um, just the last time it happened, I want to mention the name of the organization, but we had to completely suspend the organization from the website. Mm -hmm. One person, just one person, was one email complaint, and then it was already enough um, um, to start the investigation. And uh, there was was a very valid complaint, to say the least. <laughs> so the organization is no longer represented on the website. It was a nice organization on the paper. It's a non-profit, yet there were some promises. There were some other things that should mm -hmm. not have been there. Tetiana Benzurong, project manager at Volunteer The Hague. In the second half of the interview, Tetiana talks about what motivates her personally and about making a life for herself and her family in The Hague. Dutch Buzz, your weekly dose of inspiration from some of the city's special people. In our series, A String of Pearls, Dutch Buzz contributors speak to people who have made an exceptional contribution to our local community. People whose passion for what they do have had an added value for the city of The Hague. Settling in The Hague as an international can be tough when you don't have a channel for your talent and energy. Volunteer work is a popular way of getting familiar with the city and its people. Someone who's made it her passion to introduce others to volunteer work is Tetiana Benzoral, project manager at Volunteer The Hague. I asked her to bring along a few personal items to the studio so that we could get to know both her professional as well as her personal motivations. Tetiania, uh, in order to get to know you a little bit, I mm -hmm. ask you to, to photograph. That means something to you, something oh, yes. from your bedside table okay. and something off your desk. So what I found there is um, this book that I uh, was quite impressed with. It, uh, the name of the book is Hello Everybody. It's One Journalist Search for Truth in the Middle East. And it's uh, by the Dutch author Joris Leendijk. And I was referred to this book by my Dutch uh, teacher back from Rock Mondrian. And it's a. Uh, have you heard about this book? No, I haven't. And I'm a journalist. I should have. So there are people that still believe everything they see on TV mm. and uh, how to be a bit more critical about the things uh, you see yeah, on TV. Yeah, and yeah. This is a relatively old book, so it uh, was a still quite hot back back at the time when the, the refugees crisis happened and um, um, when the media was and news were flooded with some uh, staged news, so-called. So, uh, the journalist here, he's just describing his personal experience, and uh, uh, he's fluent in numerous languages, including Arabic, and he was just expressing some things. When you just read first few pages, you're already being just taken away, and in um, a couple of hours, you can read the entire book. It's just so breathtaking. And, but uh, with that, as a journalist yourself, you know how many things can be manipulated that way. Yeah. yeah. Well, my advice, personally, is to um, not to only go to one source. Mm -hmm. If you're going to um, follow a news story, do yeah. so on, have a look at BBC, what BBC says, oh, but so. also again Al Jazeera. Yeah. And then switch to CNN if they're yeah. covering the same story. And totally. when you have three sources, mm -hmm. you'll, you'll come yeah. to some kind of truth. <laughs> Absolutely, well, especially when they're being transmitted from different parts of the world. And this is uh, what Yuri is saying as well in his book, so not to just stick to one. But this is somewhat in a way outdated, but as it turned out that my bed night table is somewhat outdated as well. Okay. So it was other the love letter from my husband that I kept there sometimes when we argue so I can reread it and recall myself how much in love we still are, or this book. So I chose something a bit more intelligent, <laughs> hence the book. Ooh, I think the letters would have been quite something. <laughs> Surprisingly, he wrote it in English, even though we communicate in Russian. So <laughs> I thought it was going to be so nice in person. And then I'm reading it like, huh, for whatever reason, I always thought it was in Russian, even though I would reread it from time to time. So yes, here is the intellectual part. But this is from... Um, 
from my desk. Uh, desk. Yes, and this is a bit more of an emotional. Why don't you just read it? Um, Titania's just drawn a, uh, a beautiful pink heart. It looks like a, a pebble with an in inscription of sorts. Read it. Mm. Love is more than a feeling, it's a state of mind. And I bought it uh, a while, while ago when I just went to the United States first time in my life and I saw it in one of the shops and I just fell in love with it. The colors are so pretty and it's this, the shape is just so imperfectly perfect and the, the, the saying there it reminds me that uh, love is all around us. Uh, Love is uh, whatever you can call the energy, you can call God, you can call uh, us a being, you can call whatever you want it. But I think love is something that makes us uh, us. It's some, uh, it, when the person is filled with this positivity and love, uh, you can see it right away, and uh, it's it's not a f uh, not necessarily a romantic feeling, and it's not necessarily you know you can you can feel love to uh, to your parents, you can feel love to uh, of course your significant other, but you can also feel love to your uh, work, to uh, to some things around you, to um, to your past, to you name it. So love is really all around us. I think we in uh, dire need of huge doses of love to get us through this uh, yeah, so it pandemic of ours, hey? Yeah, yeah, just to... Love and kindness. Love and kindness, yes, to remind us that we, we do have to be appreciative, appreciative for everything we have. Yeah, and, and volunteer work is doing things for others, and I yeah. think that's important this time. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And by doing things for others, we also indeed help ourselves, because it, by helping others, in a way, we find ourselves as well. Too yeah. true. Now we well, miss only the photograph. What did you bring along? <laughs> this is back from Canada when I was still a student there. <laughs> and it looks really uh, <laughs> much adventurous, let's put it that Indeed way. Indeed adventurous. I mean, you look like Superwoman about to take <laughs> off. Yeah, it's a very powerful, striking power pose where I'm just with Describe my hands it, up. Yeah, uh, my hands are all up. I'm, I'm almost in the shape of a star. <laughs> so, with with uh, the sun setting between your arms? Yes, with the sunset between my arms and a helicopter next to me. Uh, this is a, a special helicopter. Um, in the we call it a firefighting helicopter. So I was uh, in the middle of the research um, on um, uh, wildfires suppression. So I used to work for um, uh, a university uh, called York University back in Canada around Toronto area and one of the research projects was on uh, uh, fire suppressions and how night vision goggles would help to fight wildfires. It was completely different to everything I've done before the university or in my life. That's why this uh, photo reminds me of the time that I was really adventurous. We ended up in the middle of the wildest possible areas where you cannot really get other than on a helicopter. And this is the time when my work only would start. The sun would go down and then we'd put our night goggles on, get into the helicopter and then fly further, far, far away where the wildfires would be starting. And then just see. Now, um, I heard today, just today on the news that yeah. the, um, the Amazon, again, the number of fires there are on the increase. Uh, we always have California going up in flames. Canada comes often, and of course Australia had some devastating fires. In the Netherlands, it's becoming more prominent as well. Um, yeah, very important that people are doing this work. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Women pu published a very interesting um, article about this because what night vision goggles help they help to see uh, still the the little uh, sources of the fire even though with, like the hot spot yeah. hot spots yes it seems like the fire is now suppressed but with the night vision goggles you see still that there is a activity mm. going on and with the wind with the proper conditions the fires can spark in again so yeah this there's probably the some vol volunteer work in that field too i think most women are oh, volunteers aren't they yeah, yeah, and this was a volunteer work of mine as well. <laughs> but this was a, was an awesome, awesome It seems project. to be a theme in your life. Yeah, yeah, because uh, there are things that you cannot really do uh, when, uh, you know, when you're paid, you're focusing on... Uh, 
um, on profitability, on a career, on uh, on the return of your time and investment. But when you are volunteering, it's a different state of mind. You want to do something for others. Uh, you think about the animals that are can, that can be affected. I don't want to say dying, but they can be affected by the fires. You 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 get really close with other people like-minded that are participating on the project. You find out so many things about firefighting uh, and in this sort of conditions of wild uh, um, forests where people don't really live, they cannot even get through. So it's, um, it was uh, also a fantastic way to see wild Canada, really, really wild Canada. Yeah. Well, Titania, that, uh, you really showed me another side of you now. <laughs> I think That's... we can end on that note. Um, project Manager at Volunteer The Hague, Tatiana Benzoural. Thank you for joining us on Dutch Buzz. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. <laughs> for Dutch Buzz, I'm Lilian Strobach. And if you're looking for volunteer work, volunteerthehague.nl. That's volunteerthehague.nl. Dutch Buzz, we focus on the international community in The Hague. Den Haag,